Disclaimer. The difficulty ranking of this tier list is entirely from my personal experience, so you may disagree. With that being said, I would love to see below in the comments your ideal order. The perspective I chose will be a combination of first-time experience and long-term experience. Now, let's take a look at my personal order from easiest to hardest of every single boss in Dark Souls 3. Number 1. Walnir, the High Lord of Karthus, sentenced countless souls to gruesome deaths, keen to outlive everybody. Ironically, in terms of gameplay, he is fairly simple to kill. His bracelets become the main focal point of the fight, boiling down the scary atmosphere and the size of the boss to a mere gimmick. But to me, it's a fun one, especially on a first playthrough. Once you figure out that the only thing keeping Walnir from crumbling to dust is those fake gold bands from eBay, he'll be fleeing to his computer to file a complaint. Number 2. Ever since the establishment, all manners of curse have been managed to seep into the undead settlement. Awaiting your arrival in a courtyard tended by workers with pronged plows and pointy hats is the biggest damn tree you've ever seen in your life. I mean, he has a variety of slow melee attacks and can drop damaging fruits in the first phase, but with a half-decent weapon level and or fire, you can pop all the weak spots on his body, rendering the thing useless and adding another addition to the gimmick boss category. I heard if you're having trouble on the second phase, he may lend you a hand. Number 3. Udex meaning judge in Latin and meaning battle in Old Germanic. Gundir is essentially the test of your strength in battle and fittingly is placed as the very first boss encounter. Now, in my personal opinion, this does not make him the easiest boss. FromSoft seems to have a decent grasp on staggering the difficulty throughout the playthrough, so you never get this linear difficulty. Because of that, I believe Gundir offers a semi-decent challenge being non-gimmicky and having an array of melee attacks as well as a phase 2 form that changes up the flow and extends his mobility and reach. Number 4. Crystal Sage. One of two twins, one entrusted as a spiritual guide to scholars of the Grand Archives and another to join forces with the Undead Legion. This boss can be absolutely smoked, dude. I mean it. Like, go into your kitchen and put a tablespoon of butter in the microwave and watch that shit melt. No difference when it comes to Sage when you know what you're doing. But let this enemy build momentum and you might be the one that becomes liquefied. Number 5. The last living witness of the chaos of Izalith, Old Demon King, is secretly just a chill elderly dude in a scary package. He's not going to chase you as intensely as he used to. He probably will run out of energy if you hit him enough. And while he still has half of the tricks he used to from back in the Golden Age, he probably prefers to play it safe and sip decaf coffee while feeding the birds in the park. I have to rank him higher on one particular condition. You can get stuck in his hammer and die? What? That's no fun. Number 6. A congregation of clerics defending the roaming soul of the archdeacon. Definitely not what you'd expect to see when entering the cathedral. I mean, I expected Aldrich after they hyped him up before arriving there. Instead, he decided to become a pudding monster that bathes in Coca-Cola and likes to eat people. But we'll get to that later. Deacons of the Deep are a fairly straightforward fight. You attack the highlighted target, and you get to progress towards phase 2. Repeat this 5 times, and you get to fight the archdeacon. Sounds simple, right? But if you let these church boys build up their curse attack, you might as well just cry. That is the sole reason that I rank Deacon in this spot. Number 6. Ancient Wyvern is just that boss. I mean, a boss that's not a boss. They kind of just made it one. The real challenge of this is getting to the part where you can deliver a one-shot plunge attack to its cranium and then feel like you just did way too much damage. I'm looking at you, you no good cheater. So, in the end, you have two reliable options to kill it and some others that take a while. You can do the speedrun trick and get the quick kill, that takes practice, or trek through collections of dudes that may be snakes in costumes, but we don't ask questions about that. Number 7. The descendant of an ancient conqueror and leader of his own people. Yorm the Giant is one of my absolute favorite fights in the entire game. I know that this is an unpopular opinion, but to me, FromSoft took the Storm Ruler gimmick from Demon Souls and made it more interactive, with a boss that actually exists on the ground, and can step on you too. Now, Yorm just dies in a handful of charge attacks from the Storm Ruler, but there is one glitch that was never fixed where he just doesn't take damage or stagger even though he should, resulting in you being left wide open for a beatdown. This glitch and the challenge of discovering the gimmick for myself on the first playthrough are the two most important reasons that I'd place Yorm at number 8. Number 9. Vort, serving as an Outrider Knight alongside Dancer, is probably not a boss you assumed I would put this high up. The reason is mainly Phase 2 Vort is Hitbox City. His entire body is literally becoming lethal. And while he isn't extremely fast, he puts up what I feel is a solid fight and offers even more challenge on low damaging runs and even first playthroughs. Number 10. Former Saint of the Deep and Devourer of Gods, this chocolate pudding monster spurting half of a humanoid that's pale enough to be a member of My Chemical Romance is a fair challenge and even more frustrating when he shoots arrows and magic at you from afar. Phase 2 is difficult enough on a first playthrough to rank him higher, but since you can play aggressive enough to kill him before all of the nonsense and effectively prevent arrows in phase 2 altogether, he gets the number 10 spot. Number 11. Osiris, driven mad by the research of Seath the Scaleless and his quest to gain immortality, also had a knack for dropping things. Basically, the next time you need a babysitter, don't call him. This boss has a fairly simple phase 1 that boasts a decent variety of swipes, slams, and jumps. Still nothing crazy until his phase 2 charge attack, which has the shortest startup animation in the game. In fact, it just simply doesn't have one. You are virtually required to estimate and pray for Miyazaki's forgiveness. Also, you can't cut off his tail. 
I'm not impressed. Number 12, a group of undead warriors seeking out any sign of the abyss in which they realize they're kind of spooky themselves and friendly fire on each other. For the player, the friendly fire greatly helps manage phase one and helps you plan your attacks. The watcher's moveset is nimble and has enough variety to throw off even seasoned players once in a while. The phase two addition of fire gives this boss massive bloodborne vibes and is a nice touch, but damn is it hard to escape once you get sucked in. Number 13, a distant daughter of the formal royal family, Pontiff ordered her to serve as a dancer and an outrider knight. Dancer of the Boreal Valley is a boss that is one of my absolute favorites mechanically and atmospherically. With two blades that deal staggered attacks, spins, and slashes, the fight has a lot more to offer with attack variety. I mean, the phase transition alone has gotta be inspired by Beyblade, right? That's fucking cool, man. With this all being said, Dancer's moveset can be minimized to a smaller group of easier attacks by playing close range and aggressive. Because of this, she gets spot number 13. Number 14. For this boss, I had to pop over to Reddit and see what's up. Oh shit, man. Madeira is no joke. This guy can't beat him. Oh wait, never mind, he did. That's good stuff. Let me upvote that. Wait, what the fuck? Why, why can't I upvote? Anyways. One of the most critically acclaimed bosses for difficulty and certainly one of the largest enemies in the game. I mean, look at this unit of a creature here. Medir seems to be much harder first time around, but becomes way easier once you realize you just need to boop the snoot. With using lightning and being close range, you can get a stagger, finishing him off fairly easier than before, decreasing the time that you fight him and keeping his moveset a tad more limited. A good example of this that I must shout out is Ptolemyo's original tutorial on how to beat Madeira SL1 with no rolling. I'll make sure to link it in the description below. Number 15. Once a champion of Ash like our player character, Champion Gundir is a large warrior in heavy armor and armed with a large iron halberd. Basically in simple words, remember the guy from the beginning? the first boss dude bro guy? Yeah, you do. Well, they taught him karate, and actually he got a good night's sleep this time, so watch out. I don't know about those eyeballs, though. What's going on with that? Anyways, Champion Gundir is a true challenge for even expert players testing your dexterity and or parry skills if you dare to learn. Upon becoming a literal parry god, you can slow him down a ton, but good luck. This also is my favorite example of recycling an old idea to make it even better. Number 16. Wannabe evil dictator that thinks that he can have a lightsaber and still be in Dark Souls. Pontiff Sullivan is up next. Similar to Champion Gundir, becoming a parry god is a great way to minimize the stress of this boss, but let me tell you, the first time around he made me look like I was being tossed around in the most epic game of space pinball you've ever seen. At first, the boss fight kind of seemed unfair and a little surprising until I learned how important character placement is, ensuring less chaos. With a couple of tweaks in design, Pontiff could have easily made the top tier of this list. Number 17. A suit of armor belonging to a Dragon Slayer of the past and controlled by the Pilgrim Butterflies. Dragon Slayer armor is one of my favorite bosses in Dark Souls 3 and a bit underrated from time to time. He has the highest potential to combo several consecutive moves that are independent of set orders and has a decent variety in Phase 1 and 2. Add the butterfly shooting meatballs of doom and laser beams while Slayer tees up for the shot of the 18th hole, basically your booty, and it's not hard to see why he's a decently balanced boss. If you can utilize spacing instead of rolls, and use pale resin or fire, you can burn down his health quick enough to almost skip phase 2, but this requires a lot of damage. For your average player, DSA may give you a run for your money, or your money back when you sell the game. Number 18. Half-Light basically embodies all of the capabilities of the player character, and then some. You know, just seemingly infinite stamina and unlimited magic while using the best dex weapon in the game, Weeb. The reason he is no longer on the hated list is by virtue of the storyteller's staff. Upon being poisoned early in the fight, Half-Light basically becomes a potato. Now, if you're not doing it this way, you may as well check yourself into therapy, especially on a zero damage attempt. I will add that on a first playthrough, Half-Light might not take you as long because you're most likely to be geared to the teeth with late game goodies. And let's face it, I know you're summoning your friends. Don't lie. Number 19. Former king, a dragon slaying god in ancient times and a tamer of his own storm drake. This guy seems like a myth. He is. I mean, this is a video game, man. Like, I'm sorry to break it to you, but it's not real. Nameless King is my all-time favorite Dark Souls boss and one of my favorite characters in any video game for that matter. Because we are here to primarily rank difficulty and not glorify personal preferences of design, let's try to look beyond that. You're enjoying a nice cloudy adventure in the land of fairy tales and dragons. Some dude with a fake Dragon Ball Z haircut and a fake dragon literally snipes you from the sky with a lightning bolt and then lands on you to make sure you're actually dead, but if not, he'll kill his own dragon and then consume its power to really fuck you up. In Phase 1, Nameless King has a great way of teaching you independent camera control because if you lock on, it'll basically look like this. In Phase 2, he mixes up his melee moveset enough to still trip me up to this day, and manages to fly without the dragon. Okay, that's cheating. I still think he's cool though. Number 20. Before we get into this one, does anybody know why Champion Gravetender isn't wearing any pants? The man is trekking across the frozen tundra and he forgot them. Maybe he's actually Wim Hof in disguise. While you guys start a GoFundMe for getting Gravetender a pair of long johns, I'm gonna tell you why he is absolutely wild to fight, especially with low damage. The guy has once again all of the player character abilities, but can also attack and block simultaneously with his special weapon, Valor Art. Sounds lame anyways. I'm not jealous or anything. Anyways, add in discount Sif, and you may have some concerns of how you're going to progress past the wall of pantless dude leaping at your face and his overfed dog that probably ate his pants in the first place. To add, I like the wolf idea. 
I just wish that they expanded on his moveset once Grave Tender was dead. Could have easily made top three on this list. Number 21. It's unknown to which kingdom he represents or which wars he fought. An aberration created by consuming the Dark Soul itself. Slave Knight Gale is such a great end to the Ring City DLC, presumably the final piece of Dark Souls that we will get to witness. His moveset is fairly disorganized and frantic in Phase 1, really giving the sense of his madness. Phase 2 ends up slowing down but includes his repeating crossbow. I feel that this phase is the hardest part of the fight, especially on challenge runs. Managing the light disc simultaneously with the bolts and melee attacks while not getting nicked by his delayed cape is such a rewarding sequence. Phase 3 becomes extremely epic and adds environmental lightning that can actually hit you. This detail is so cool and frustrating. While Gale isn't the quickest or most aggressive at times, he has a lot of defense. The man is a fridge with legs and arms. Enough said. Number 21. This spot marks our grave. You can rest here too, if you like. A phrase you will have heard many times before completing Twin Princes, whom rejected their duty to become Lords of Cinder and settled far away to watch the fire fade from a distance. Bunch of wieners. Nah, in all honesty, I'm pretty sure that they just wanted to bait players into their playpen and record sick montages of them dunking on sorry fools that thought this game could be beaten. The teleportation of Lorien is extremely fast and must not be taken lightly. Add in plunges from the sky at random and combine all of the melee attacks with magic as well, and what do you get? A steam refund or GameStop if you bought it on disc. Number 23, unkindled, having abandoned the Sable Church and residing in the painted world. Sister Frida will make footwear look like it was never cool in the first place. It actually kind of makes me think Grave Tender was just following in her footsteps. All right, that was pretty silly. This boss is highly regarded as one of, if not the most difficult on the list. And we're at the point where the next two selections end up being about the same difficulty. So it was really hard for me to finish off this list. The best go-to for this situation is charging a heavy, and then following up with a light on Wake Up, similar to Abyss Watchers. This is the main method of damaging her safely, but due to ridiculous maneuvers that can be pulled out of nowhere, it's not too hard to see why this makes number 23. Number 24, birth from a common chaos, sharing almost everything between them, the pride of the prince and his near-fated flame. Demon in pain and the demon below forming the infamous demon prince is one of the coolest moments in gaming I can distinctly remember. This fight embodies a lot of things that make Dark Souls exciting, even the setting. Not just one, but two demons that make demons in Dark Souls 1 look like Fisher-Price toys. They have great synergy for cycling through defensive and offensive modes, sometimes mirroring each other and ultimately transforming into one of the hardest enemies in a Souls game. Demon Prince's final form is no joke. I literally have nothing funny to say about it. A variety of projectile attacks, AoEs, and absolutely rampaging makes this number two on the list, and is such a close choice to the final boss. If that's not convincing enough, he literally has two Phase 2 movesets, depending on which demon in Phase 1 dies first. Super cool detail. Number 25. Last, but certainly not least, the amalgamation of All Lords of Cinder using some of Gwyn's moveset for Phase 2 alongside a multitude of magic abilities and weapon-based combat. Soul of Cinder will make you feel like you are playing against a slot machine with Japanese AI. The thing has one of the highest moveset varieties in the series, just counting the straight sword, curve sword, javelin, and catalyst alone, but also pursues you like a dog that wants a treat and still leaves room for Gwyn's great sword move in phase two. Because of his menacing learning curve for all kinds of playthroughs, especially solo or with lower damage, he rightfully gets placed at number one. Well, that's my personal ordering, and I must say, this idea was in the works for a long time. As the meta changes for higher level gameplay, so does the perspective. If you like this, hit the notification bell, subscribe, and also if you have the time, throw your ideal ordering from easiest to most difficult below.